And we are live, folks, with episode 3469. Our guest, Matthew, will be on with us in just a moment. We are starting a bit late, but I will take responsibility for that because I originally sent the link to the wrong Matthew. So we'll, we got that corrected. We're starting just a few minutes late today, and we're going to have a great discussion. We're going to talk about concealed carry considerations in the year 2024. Like, like me, Matthew has carried for a long time. He's also... Uh, the owner of uh, Aries Tactical and makes uh, concealed carry uh, holsters and things like that. And it, it is interesting in his application. I thought this would be a good discussion, not just concealed carry, what we do to conceal carry properly, et cetera, but the changes. Like when I moved to Texas back in the 1990s, you couldn't even legally conceal carry in Texas. Then we got concealed carry with a permit. Then we got concealed carry no matter what we or actually we got open carry. Then we got open or concealed with no permit the constitutional. And so that's a lot of change in a couple decades. You go from not at all to open or concealed with no permit. And so there's a lot to discuss, a lot to unpack. And as usual, when we talk about this, I'll just throw this out. And I'm sure Matthew will reiterate it when I bring him on in just a moment. You don't live where I live. <laughs> Laws are highly variable about this, but things are getting more and more similar across the gradient. So we'll talk about that and some other uh, considerations with concealed carry, like what you carry, how you carry it, where you carry it, where you don't, all of that. Before we do, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day number one today is KnifeKits.com. Knife Kits, guys, they've been around a while. How long? I started taking sponsors in 2009. That's when I took my first sponsors, about seven, eight months into the journey. They're still here. You imagine a podcast with a sponsor who's been with them since 2009. I have several, but Knife Kits is one of them. They have really cool stuff. Uh, we had a pretty strict vetting process bringing the first sponsors in. as back in the forum days. I just basically turned my moderators loose on them like a pile of jackals and said, find me something wrong. They couldn't find anything. All the blade forums and all love these guys, you know, all that time ago. You know, we're, we're a decade and a half, guys, and we're still working with them. So if you've ever wanted to know, can I make a knife for myself? The answer is yes, they make it easy. If you're like progressing and becoming a master bladesmith or something, and you want just raw materials, they've got that too. Check out the cool mosaic pins if you're on the video. Uh, I dig that tree one right there. I, I might have Patrick do something up for me with that over at MT Knives. Uh, just, just as a thought, just looking at that. Anyway, guys, check them out. They also have all the stuff you need for making like leather holsters, leather sheets, Kydex, all of that stuff. Check them out today again, knifekits.com. Next up today is above phone. Above phone is how you cut the tether between you and big tech when it comes to your mobile needs. It is not just that AT&T or, you know, whoever you have as a carrier is spying on you. So is the manufacturer of your phone, and so is the app manufacturers on your phone. You can make that all go away with above phone. You can have a sensor-free, permissionless, private app store. And if you do need to use something out of Google Play or something like that, the standard apps, you can go ahead and use those anyway, only for what you need. And you can even, like, I love this. You can put them in their own little app prison where they only do the things that they do when you let them do it because you've decided you need to use them. It's really simple. The phones are great. And you can get 75 bucks off any of the phones at Above Phone if you are an MSB member. So definitely consider checking that out. And with that, I want to bring our special guest, Matthew, onto the show. Matthew, I hadn't said your last name yet. I wasn't sure if it was Facus or Focus, and I didn't want to pronounce it wrong. It's Facus. Facus. See, I was. It wouldn't have mattered. Fifty fifty, and I still blew it. <laughs> hey, you got know. the company name right. That's all that really matters. Yeah, Aries Tactical, and we'll talk about that today some too. Let's lead off with like, let's not worry about concealed carry or running a a tactical company. Like Matthews, years ago, you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. How do you even end up? Like, this is your path. You're going to be building uh, equipment for people uh, like you did. Right. Well, you know, coming out of high school, I knew college wasn't for me. I went into Marine Corps, you know, got to go to the first Gulf War and hang out there and get a good suntan for a while. <laughs> Came back in after that, you know, you know, after the wind down from the first Gulf War, there wasn't a lot of money being spent in the military. So no, man, I remember thinking, them paying dudes to get out. Yeah. 
It's one of the reasons Honestly, I didn't stay in. I was like, if they value these guys that little, then I don't want to be them one day. Well, I mean, in the Marine Corps, when you're on base in the rear, they play yeah. games all the time to keep you busy. At least yeah. when you're overseas, you get to do more stuff. And yeah. you know, my time started to come up towards the end there. They said it'll be at least 18 months before you can get sent anywhere. So I was like, I think I'm checking out now. <laughs> uh, went to college, was doing retail sales in the outdoor gear market for a while there. Uh, come up to 99. This is where our paths crossed slightly. I was in the telecom industry doing wireless internet. Okay. So while you were trying to trench fiber, I was trying to convince people they could do microwave to building the building better than and cheaper than what you could do. Okay. So that ran its course for a few years. Uh, started to get more into shooting. You know, that late 90s, uh, concealed carry in Virginia started to open up to be more of a shell issue state, which well, I guess we'll talk about a little bit later. You know, differences. Okay. So that's when I first got my concealed carry permit. So I've been carrying since then. <clears throat> Along the way, I got asked uh, to do overseas contracting, you know, from my background, some of the people I knew, I had done personal protection specialists, which is basically bodyguard work. So I spent a couple of years over in Afghanistan working on stuff. And when I came back, I was doing some domestic, you know, personal protection work. And that is really where the knife or where the holster company came around is I needed a holster. I went to one of the holster makers. They said, it's going to be 16 weeks and 150 bucks. And I'm like, you give me 150 bucks in 16 weeks for a holster. I bet you I could figure this out. Yeah. So I made my first holster for myself and I carried it on my detail. And everybody else on the detail was like, that's great. You know, I came at it with a little bit different perspectives than what some yeah. other people were doing. So I made them all stuff. And the wife had another kid and she goes, I'm tired of you disappearing for weeks or months on end. I don't want to be a single mom. You need to stay here more often. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I started going to gun shows saying, hey, look what I can do. Yeah. And put a website up, ran the website. And here we are 11 years later, still making holsters, still my full time business. I, I laughed there when you said, look what I can do, because I have this weird memory that remembers all kinds of weird shit. And it made me think of the skits that used to be on Mad TV with Stuart. Look what I can do. <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's like the way to really market is to tell your story. And there is a lot of power in the visual components of the story and being able to tell somebody here, try you know, go ahead and try this holster. Here's a blue gun. See what drawing from it, what the comfort's like is huge because I struggle still with finding like really the most comfortable way to carry, especially like June through September when the sun tries to kill us here in Texas. Like right. in winter, like I have this really cool vest that my buddy turned me on to. And, you know, you don't look weird with a vest on in Texas in December, but you, you, you might as well just put concealed carry in giant letters like DEA letters on your back if you were doing that in the summer here. So yeah. I think that's a great way. First best. Yeah, I think it's a great way to make the point, you know, like this is this is a really great holster because it fits well, it's comfortable, it draws well. Like those are the things that I think most people that carry are most concerned about is like I don't want to print heavily, I don't want it digging into my gut. You know, when I when I sit down, I don't want to look like I'm adjusting my uh my male parts or whatever a lot. I just want to be comfortable and but when I need it. Man, I want to. I don't want to be sitting there, you know, getting shot while I'm trying to draw my weapon. Yep. So, let's talk about like right out of the gate. This might sound like a weird question, but I think people do need to hear an answer to this. What does it mean when you say concealed carry? Because things are a lot different now. Like I said, right now, uh, I could I could throw on my big leather hunting shoulder holster, my my giant Canon 357 hunting revolver stick that in there and, and and I can go out and it may make people uncomfortable, but legally I, I, I am fine, but I, I don't, I don't take that approach, you know, I, and I don't see any, like for all the fight to get it done. And I'm glad they did here in Texas. I, I hardly ever see anybody open carry. And so, you know, can we talk just a little bit about concealed carry and, and not just what it is, but why? Well, concealed carry <clears throat> most simply is, having a hidden firearm with you as you move about the day. 
you know, the reason why we're talking about what you've talked about before was an open carry. And you mentioned it a little bit earlier, which is having a firearm on your hip or in a you know chest holster or something like that, where the whole world can see. Mm -hmm. Concealed carry gives you an element of surprise if a bad guy decides to act that he doesn't know that you have a firearm. So keeping it concealed, one, gives you an element of surprise against an aggressor. Secondly, it doesn't freak out a lot of people. You know, you standing in line to get your order at, you know, Wendy's or whatever like that, and you have your 357 on your hip, people are going to look at you weird, whether it's legal or not. They're just yeah. like, they're not used to it. And because they're not used to it, it's not really socially acceptable, even though it's legally acceptable. Correct. Yeah, I think like the one time I'll see it here is like sometimes I'll see a guy with like a, a, a gun on him. It's at like the feed store or something. Like, and that's like, usually some farmer that had to run out and he carries while he's working because coyotes, whatever. And, you know, he's going to, and, and I think it's good that we have it because of that, but I see it as a tactical disadvantage. So, I mean, you think about, and I've said this a lot of times, I do carry to protect myself, but I carry as much for that as to protect others. And reality is if I'm walking out to my car and somebody decides to come up and stab me with a screwdriver, it's very likely they're going to get, they're going to do that before I get a chance to defend myself. A third party, though, I can. I'm in an observational position. I'm in an, a really great position to intervene on a third party's behalf. But if you are talking about some of these mass shootings and all, if I'm a bad dude and I walk into a restaurant, for instance, and I see a guy with a gun, guess who I'm shooting first? Right? Am I not going to immediately like like scan the area? Okay, this dude and this dude have a gun. They're my first two targets. But if right. I'm concealed, then I'm just another person. That, that's like, I have a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. The, the proponents for open carry, their main argument is, if I have a gun with me and it's seen that a bad guy won't do anything. Mm. Unfortunately, bad guys don't think like that. Mm -mm. Bad guys think like, oh, look, he's carrying a $600 gun on his hip. You know, just like if you wear a you know $4,000 Omega watch. They're yeah. like, I know I can get money for that watch. I can get yeah. money for that gun. Or yes, maybe they exactly. want a gun and they can't buy one, right? So, right. like, there's my, I've been wanting a gun, look. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you, you see these situations where, um, uh, you know, the shooting where the security guard gets shot first because he's got the gun. Yeah. yeah. If you're that open that, carry that, um, person and you're visible, you'll that, be the person they go first. That's exactly what happened at that, uh, that gay nightclub in Florida years ago. Right. There was a dude, there was an on duty, like off duty officer on duty as a security guard with a gun. First person that was taken out. I mean, the guy that did it had been there and knew that setup. Right. So it would have been much better if that off duty officer was armed and in the shadows than standing at the door with the gun on. Yeah. The, the good news, I think, in Texas, and this was a huge part of why the movement got so strong, depending on what jurisdiction you were in. Concealed meant concealed all the time, all the way. And anything that could be taken as brandishing could be prosecuted as a felony. And there were instances where people were uncomfortable. A guy goes into a, a store, you know, and buy something and asks for change in a five and ones instead of a 10. And as he leans over, the guy sees his gun and he like calls the police and said he was being, you know, jacked. And like the law was so tight. It was like, if you printed, you brandished. So the good news with that is it took that away. Like, and I think yeah, that, that's, 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 you know, that's prosecutorial discretion. So yeah. you can be in a state that allows concealed carry. But like you said, if the prosecutor in that area doesn't like it and somebody complains, they're going to throw it. I mean, take a look at Rittenhouse, who clearly yeah. on video was the self-defense case, and they still tried to run him through the ringer. Dude, thank God that guy got a decent judge. I don't feel like the judge stacked the deck in either direction, but I think he made sure that was a, that, that was a fair trial. And, you know, and I think he really probably wanted the outcome that came, but I think he did his job, but like you are really throwing a dart at a random board with a, with a blindfold on when you trust prosecutors on discretion yep. and judges on discretion as well. Let's talk about the legalities of it and how maybe that's changed over the years. Like, I still think there's people that think, oh, if you have a gun that and you're carrying it in public, that's illegal. And I think that that is really subject to where you are, when you're there, et cetera. But like, I think concealed carry is in one way or another legal in every state in the country now. Right. Uh, there is concealed carry in almost all 50 states. 
Right now, what you're looking at is there's 29 states which have called constitutional carry or called permitless carry, which means if you meet the requirements, you don't have to ask permission to carry a firearm. Mm -hmm. Some of that's open, some of that's concealed. You have about 48 states after the New York State rifle and pistol you know, went to Supreme Court and got in their favor. So there's 48 states, which are called shall issue states. They have a set of requirements. You fill out your paperwork, you pay your money. If you meet those requirements, they have to give you the permit to carry a concealed firearm. So even now, when you take a look at like California, which is massively anti-gun, they have over 100,000 permits issued. New York State, another very anti-gun state, they have over a quarter million permits that have already been issued. And then you have two outliers, which are Delaware and Connecticut. Those are called May issue states. Mm -hmm. So you fill out the paperwork, you submit it, and then a police chief or a judge makes a final decision whether you're worthy to have a concealed carry permit. And, and I, I think we need to reiterate on that. There are states that are shell issue that still have that. And it's basically the chief or the sheriff has to sign off unless there's a reason not to. But there are like that's that's how Pennsylvania is still. You know, you have to get your chief law enforcement uh, officer for your area to sign off on it. But they have to do it unless they can yeah. show cause like, oh, you're a felon. Right. That right. would be cause. Other than that, pretty much. Uh, and I think there is like a lot of those states like there is some case by case stuff like. If you're a guy that's been, you know, had domestic disputes called on you multiple times in the past, even if you weren't convicted at a felony level, they they might be able to get it. But it has to be something very much concrete. Otherwise, they've got to they've got to issue. Yeah. The permit. You're basically if you're a felon, you're not allowed to have a pistol or you know, you know firearm anyway. So that's an yeah. automatic disclosure. Like you said, yeah. if you have domestic you know, abuse or you have a violent uh, offense on your record, even if it's not a felony, that can be enough to prevent you from getting, you know, a concealed carry permit. But, you know, having a speeding ticket doesn't disqualify you. You can't no. find these no. BS charges or, yeah. you know, you didn't file your income taxes last year. They don't, they're not going to, you know, you know, forward that paperwork. Yeah. But they can definitely, you know, in some of these states, drag their feet on the approval process and make it, you know, instead of a week or a month, you know, many months, or they can try to charge ridiculous fees, which I've seen a lot of people are, are have fought back against, you know, the $250 application fee, you know, like, well, that kind of makes it unrealistic for a lot of people to pay that kind of money. So that has been pulled back in some states on these ridiculous fees. What would you tell a person in a state like Texas or the other 28 states that have done it now that have constitution carry that says, well, I don't see any reason to get a, a concealed carry license now because I can carry without one. Are, are there some advantages still to doing it, especially in a state like Texas where like it, you literally almost have to be a felon or like the cops have to be at your house every other day to not immediately just get signed off on and go ahead and get your shit. Well, the number one thing is that concealed carry permit people are often afforded more areas in which they can carry concealed, such as like if you go to school, schools are almost 100 percent off limits for concealed carry going into the school. But you could be in the car pickup line at school if you're a concealed carry permit holder versus a constitutional carry in that state might not allow it. So you you're allowed to go more areas. Uh, and again, this is state by state and goes all yeah. over the place like going to a restaurant that serves alcohol. If you have a permit, you may be allowed to eat there with a concealed carry permit. And depending on state, you might actually be allowed to actually have a drink while, you know, with permitted in concealed carry. Yeah. Versus if you don't, you're not allowed to do that. Yep. The other thing is from a legal standpoint, if you are in a confrontation, you have at least this piece of paper where you can say, look, I I followed your rules to carry this pistol. I went to your training that you said I should have for this. It gives you a little bit more protection against, you know, prosecution. Hmm. Yeah. I, the other thing is like here in Texas, like let's say you go to a storefront and they have a picture with a gun with the Ghostbuster thing going through it and you're, you're licensed. That means absolutely positively nothing. It, it, it's an irrelevant thing that in our law it has to be posted a specific statute, and it's just ironic that the statute's 30.06. Um, 
And so that the 30.06 statute covers, even if you're a licensed concealed carry holder, you cannot carry on this private premises. The owner said no, which a lot of people get in a wad about. I might not give that person business, but I totally respect their right to, to make that decision. The geniuses in, in our legislature figured if 306 was for concealed, 307 was for open. And so if you want to, if you want to now deny the rights of both of those, you have to actually post both of those signs okay. in a window. So it's important that you know that uh, and, and you know that um, no guns by a private uh, holder of a piece of property, just no guns, if you do not have a permit applies to you. Right. So it's totally legal for me to carry. But, you know, the person that hasn't specifically sought because that gives that um, property owner some flexibility in that, you know what, if you are licensed and you've had a background check, I trust you to carry in my establishment. So, I, again, I think everybody that wants to carry should be able to carry as long as you're not causing any problems. But I get property rights. And I think that's one. And I guess the other one would be rest, state reciprocity, because there are states that they even have open carry. But you're not from here, so not for you. But if you have a permit right. from a reciprocity state, then you can carry. And I think it just makes your life easier. And I don't know what it costs in other states, but in Texas, it's like 45 bucks for five years or six years or something like that. Right. Yeah, it's enough the, that I don't remember. It's the, deep the enough East I don't Coast remember. Area. Right. So when you're in the East Coast area and you go through multiple states really easily at, versus Texas yeah. where you drive all day and you're still in the same state. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's beneficial to have that carry permit that's been issued by the state because open state, like I said, you know, a constitutional state may or may not allow somebody who's not a resident of the state, a full-time resident of the mm -hmm. state to carry. So I go to, you know, certain states across the border, they have, you know, a constitutional carry state, but they're like, you're not from here. You're not allowed to do that. Correct. So having that permit, they usually have reciprocity. You can go to places like uh, concealcarry.com or USCCA, you know, there's tons of maps out there where you just click on your state and you can see what your laws are in your state, which states honor your permit. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how it is everywhere in Texas. If I go to buy a gun and I'm like, I want to buy that gun. Usually you have to fill out 4440 and it's no big deal, but it's, it's one more thing to do in, in Texas. If you just hand them your concealed carry permit, you don't have to fill out the form. They just sell you the gun. I don't That's know exactly a, how that works or whatever, but it, it it's like it's like a, a FFL light or something just to have a concealed carry permit. That's certainly a lot more convenient. Yeah, yeah. So just the convenience alone is probably worth that. Um, what do you feel about as far as training for concealed carry? Is it necessary or is it just a good idea? Um, this 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 is interesting. From a fundamental constitutional point, I believe it should not be required. From a practical standpoint, I think it's foolish not to get training. And I look to get training in four areas. You know, one, take a class that is a concealed carry focus class that teaches you how to draw from concealed carry, you know, some of the considerations and be able to hit your target, you know, reliably. Also take a look at training is you should take a martial arts training. You should take some type of empty hand fighting skill, you know, get punched in the face, yeah. get pushed around somebody who's not compliant, you know, is going to give you a little bit of pushback. I won't tell you which ones to do because there's going to be somebody who's going to jump in and complain that I didn't mention their favorite one or the one that I mentioned was complete junk. But there's a lot of good fighting styles that are out there. And that just gives you an extra level or an extra tool in your toolbox that you might not need to pull your firearm out if you're confident in your ability to defend yourself or defend your you know, people around you. The other type of training that I really recommend for people is get some type of medical training. You need to have some type of traumatic care training. You know, there's classes called Stop the Bleed or in the military, they have TCCC that teach you how to deal with severe trauma type injuries. And if you're out, you're more likely to use that to stop a severe bleed, maybe in a car accident, maybe in a shooting than you are to ever pull your firearm out in, you know, self-defense. And the fourth, you know, training, I'll call it, is get into some type of shooting competition. You know, there's IDPA, USPSA. You know, the advantage of that is one, you're getting trigger time. Two, you're getting put into multiple scenarios that you don't normally think about. I mean, it's one thing to go to Uncle Buck's farm, throw out some cans and shoot them from the hip, right? 
but it's a whole nother thing to in a competition to sit down in a chair at a table and then have to start to engage targets because mm -hmm. people don't do that. You know, if you go out and shoot with your buddies, that's not usually something you do, but in competition, they'll put you in these kinds of environments where you're just like, Oh, what am I supposed to do? And yeah. you know, it's one of those things once you've kind of gone through it and your brain started to work these problems out, if it comes off, you know, comes again to you later on in real life, you're like, I've done this before. I understand. It helps you also to shake out your equipment, you know, to, to really define what works for you. So if you're shooting IDPA, that requires you to wear some type of cover garment, whether it is a shirt over your pistol or a vest or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you start to shoot one or two competitions. You start to realize, you know what? I thought this works, but it doesn't work it for doesn't. me. Yeah. And then you start messing with your gear. Okay, I need yeah. a different holster or I need to put put it in a little bit different way. Maybe I need to change the angle of what I'm already carrying to make yeah. it more comfortable. I mean, you see people, um, you know, in competition, it's kind of funny when it doesn't happen to you, but they'll sit down in these chairs and almost always they'll have the plastic lawn chairs that people will sit in and they'll go to stand up to shoot and their pistol will get caught in the chair and they'll, you know, the whole chair will come up with them. And you're yeah. like, that slows you down in competition, but it's far better to make the mistakes in competition yeah. Yeah, and make and a, new appendix carrier was, a new appendix carrier was just born. Right? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> often happens with those types of scenarios. There's a couple of things in that, though. Like the martial arts thing, I completely agree with. I don't know if it was this week or last week. I just talked about this, though. One of the things people need to get in their mind, I think it was yesterday's show, honestly, is that if I'm if I'm armed, Right. And, and, and I'm out and about and I end up in a conflict that I don't feel the need to escalate to an armed conflict, but there's some sort of physical confrontation. Then I am in a conflict where a gun is involved, whether the other party has one or not. The fact that I have it means that there is potential for it to play a role like we're, we're rolling around and a guy gets his hand on my. That's why I'm not rolling around with a guy when I got a gun on. Right. So I could be yeah. as long as he doesn't jump me from behind or something, because his hand goes to that. And if he kills me or even wounds me, he's going to tell the cops. So I had to kill him. He tried to shoot me. He had a gun. It's his gun, not mine. Yeah. That automatically makes you look like the aggressor. So you need to be able to handle yourself. so You don't end up drug into that sort sort of physical conflict. Um, I also think that the, the point about competition for some people, that may be the only way they can gain that experience. If you live somewhere where you can shoot in your backyard or like when I grew up in Pennsylvania, every other stripping hole you could go shoot, a uh, guy opened a gun range there and everybody laughed like you're going to go broke because there's plenty of places to shoot. Um, but like around here, there, unless you know somebody, there's not a lot of like public land you can just go shoot on or unless you have land, you have to go to a range. Well, most ranges, they will not let you draw and shoot. Right. Let alone sit down in a chair, stand up and draw and shoot unless it's a sanctioned competition. Yep. So for a lot of people, if they're going to get that experience at all, you're either doing it with airsoft, which I think is great training for muscle memory, but it is not the same, or you don't get it at all unless you do like what you're saying. Yeah. One of the other things I want to talk about is, is with concealed carry shooting classes and martial arts, you have a different set of confidence about yourself. And when you have confidence, you carry yourself differently. You look less like prey. You know, bad guys are looking for easy targets. They're not looking for the biggest, baddest guy to take down. They want get what they get and get out of there as fast as possible. So when you take these things, you become more confident in your own ability. And it it it's invisible, but people notice that sort of thing, especially criminals. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I would say is safety, just basic gun safety, which I think most states do have a requirement to get a license of taking a basic safety course, which would be great. I didn't get how important this was until I was a, a, a kid in the army in basic training and they gave everybody a, a friggin' M16, right? And this is old school Vietnam era, fully auto <laughs> M16s back in those days, man. And um, I mean, to defend the army and the drill sergeants when they issue, you know this from being in the Corps, they issue rifles, you, you pretty much live with that rifle for all of basic, but you're not getting your hands on ammo. Like there's an ammo shakedown at the end of every range day and all. And for yeah. the first couple of weeks, you don't see ammo, right? It's all dry fire and stuff like that. But when I would look around and see some of my fellow recruits and the way they were handling a rifle, I it freaked me out. 
and I had grown up in a hunting family, surrounded by hunting family, surrounded by hunting family. I grew up in a place where they closed school for the first day of deer season. The, you know, the, my, my English teacher that was a five foot, two inch little woman could tell you how to properly handle a gun. And all of a sudden I'm around people and going, holy shit. Like some people don't have any idea how to have the most basic concept of like muzzle discipline and, and trigger discipline. It's one of those things. If you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. And that's as much as I'm for rights and freedom, man. When, when I think back to that, I'm like, I really hope that every single person that puts a gun on their body has had some training, whether it's by, you know, grandparents or a professional, but some training in safety because they don't know what they don't know. And then you see these people that like, I've been carrying my whole life. And this is one of the drills I do. And they put a video up on Twitter and the guy blows a hole in the side of his leg doing some kind of fast draw bullshit or something. Yeah. It's like, dude, that should never, that should never happen. There's, right? there's that should tons never of videos happen. on Instagram of people shooting themselves. There's a lot of them. Do you see the DEA agent, DEA agent shoot himself in the classroom? Yeah. Yeah. So right, that with his clock, right? His clock 19 or his clock 20 or whatever the hell it was. And and that was just like, oh, minutes shit. after he said, I'm a professional. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been trained in Kapow. <laughs> I will give that dude one thing. He took shooting himself better than I've ever seen anybody do it. He was like, see, that was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> There's um, another yeah, one guys at a range teaching a small class, and he's got his you know 44 Magnum revolver, or whatever, and he shoots the ceiling. Oh. And he got he just he just rolled with it like nothing happened. And one of the students mentions, you know, like, is that supposed to happen? Well, see, because I had good muzzle discipline, nothing bad happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the bullshit cover. Um what what do you is there any before we move from training is there any additional training that you would maybe recommend beyond what we talked about already no i think that really covered you know those four different areas you know a real firearms class is dedicated to conceal carry or like a fighting pistol class one that gets you you know good trigger time helps you work with your draw helps you make sure that your sights are aligned and you're squeezing trigger so you're hitting what you need to shoot at the medical you know bad things happen whether guns involved or not you know people accidentally stab themselves or they cut themselves with a chainsaw you need to be able to handle traumatic injuries yeah and then the martial arts again it's just another tool and you know level of confidence if somebody kind of gets up in your face you don't have to pull your gun out right away if you have some type of training you understand i understand physical distance and creating distance from people and then again you know put that to use in a in a class or in in a firearm shooting competition that lets you get more trigger time in and expose you to different scenarios that you might not have thought about before. Um, that actually just made me think of like a niche for somebody out there to maybe develop. So as you were talking about the martial arts thing, I was thinking, well, what martial art would I recommend? And I agree with you, learn how to handle yourself. And in my, my but my mind first went like with all the the, the blocks and the, the green zone, red zone and every, or the, 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 the locks and the green zone, red zone concept and all jujitsu. But the first thing you're doing in jujitsu is running, rolling around on the ground. It, it, it would be really interesting for someone to develop a limited martial arts training specifically for the concealed carry person, because my, my situation, if I'm armed, my goals, if I'm in a physical confrontation, are entirely different with that gun on me than without that gun on me. And I know right. that people would say that's not the case, but it is the case. And, and I've always been like, you need to know how to grapple, but that does not mean to be where you go at first. And we used to do training with this. And like somebody would say how badass they were as a grappler. And we put them with somebody that was good enough to, to engage them. And they would engage them and they'd be down on the ground ready to, to, to put that submit lock on and you just walk up behind him and take your foot and just stomp two inches away from their forehead. Yep. And just boom, and that boot comes down and they're like, Oh, I see. There's really <laughs> only one person that I, that I'm aware of, but I only know yeah. a little bit of the world. Right. And that's yeah. Craig Douglas at Shiv works. He does training like that, that close, extreme close quarters. When you have a knife, when you have a firearm, I mean, he has classes where you're in a car and, you know, somebody carjacks you or somebody, you know, sitting in your car and gets violent, you know, working in these confined spaces. I'm sure there's other people, but he's the first person I've seen do it. And he's really the only person I've seen that actually has classes focused on that sort of environment. 
Yeah. I, I do think there's maybe a, for a lot of trainers, uh, even within any discipline, like a niche there, like a short, like six weeks intensive or something, because it is something that's way under considered because people get a gun. They're like, I got a gun now. I don't care. Well, yeah, but life cares. Yeah. Life cares. One thing right? that police training, you know, covers. And if you've had the opportunity to train with some, they do some weapon retention training. Yeah. That's not yeah. something that you would normally see going into a Muay Thai or a Brazilian no. jiu-jitsu place. They're not going to teach you how to, def, you know, keep your weapon from being taken from you. No, they teach you how to take a weapon from other people, which is not always a good idea either. Yeah. Um, once you reach for my weapon, I'm totally justified in using lethal force. That's 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 part of our law here anyway. What, what are your thoughts on, like, you see a crime going down? And I think this is a like a dimmer switch variable thing. Like, if I see somebody grabbing somebody's purse and running through the parking lot, I'm probably not laying them out like a deer on the first day. Right. Like, right. I think it depends on what's going on. But what are your thoughts on the citizen intervention in that that crime that you witness going on? Well, I, I heard your concealed carry podcast from earlier this month. So I yeah. kind of know where you're coming from. So yeah. give me a couple seconds. But sure. in general, get out of there as soon as possible. Call the police. You okay. don't need to interact. Now, there are certain examples. You know, the reason why I say that is you often don't have all the information necessary to make a decision. Agreed. You're getting a glimpse of something. Now, you have uh, Jack Wilson down in 2019, the Texas church shooting. Texas church shooting. Yeah. He's there. He visibly watches a person pull out a weapon in the church. That's a pretty clear cut case of where you can use self defense and kill somebody. Um, and that, that guy and, still killed two people before Jack put him down. Yeah. Then you have Elijah Dickens out in Indiana Mall, right? Yeah. Well, he's sitting there in the food court and he hears bang, 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 turns around, sees somebody shooting people and he engages them. That's a pretty clear cut. But let's say that you're up in Buffalo when that guy goes into the grocery store and starts shooting people and you're three aisles back with your kid. You know, are you going to go running up there with a gun and be like, I'm the superhero? Or are you going to take care of your family? I'm going to take care of my kid if I got my kid. Yeah. And so, I mean, if I'm alone, that, that's a totally different answer. If I'm alone or I have somebody I'm looking after, that, that's right. a totally different answer. I mean, you, you talked about having a moral obligation and not being a coward. If you are able to affect a positive outcome, you should try to do that. But you also have a moral obligation to your family. I mean, if you're the breadwinner and you do something stupid like interjecting yourself, It'll say a domestic, you know, there's a domestic outside. You're at a restaurant, you know, husband and a wife are yelling and screaming at each other, maybe throwing a glass of water or something like that. Yeah. You inserting yourself into that situation is asking for trouble. And if you get, you know, shanked of a knife that's on the table or he shoots you because he's got a gun and you're not able to take care of your family that, you know, that's a, you, like I said, it's a, it's a dimmer switch of, to whether you actually should jump into a situation or not. You know, that's how I kind of view it. Uh, it's like if you don't have all the information, you can certainly get yourself in a lot of trouble. I mean, you see these dirt bag undercover cops, you know, beating up on somebody. You're like, I see that guy beating some other guy. I should go up and shoot him. Well, no, you just shot an undercover officer. Yeah, he didn't have time to explain that he's undercover, and you just jumped into the situation because you didn't know what's going on. So we seem to have this mindset that the guy losing the fight, if we didn't see the fight start, is the victim. Right. And that's not always the case. You have no idea. Like you said, it could have been an undercover officer. It could be that the guy that's laying the beat down on was attacked by the guy. He's like, you know, yep. you, you don't get to just go up and punch somebody in the face or threaten them and not get a response. Yep. And I don't want to be a third party injuring somebody who's the actually the good guy in the scenario or that whatever was going on wasn't enough to warrant taking a life. Yeah. The other thing that you need to be considerate of is what a lot of people call the Bubba effect. You know, I am in the grocery store. I do hear the shooting. You know what? There's 15 other guys concealed carry running up to the front, all yeah. jacked up because they heard gunshots. And now they see you round the corner with a gun. Yes. You know, are they yeah. trained to a level where they can discern you are a threat or not a threat? So, so if yeah. you can avoid the situation, Go outside and make a call. I mean, but if you are there and you see somebody going bang, 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 bang down the aisles, it, you have a moral obligation to try to stop that person. 
I also think that's why being able to draw and reholster is so important. So if I am in a situation, there is a shooting, I do engage the, 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 the person with the assault. I know I've put them down. I don't want to be standing there with that gun when Bubba runs around with his 357. And, and let's just be honest, as much as I am pro, you know, concealed carry pro gun rights, there are people, they're just waiting for their chance. Right. right. And, and I don't want appear to be Bubba's chance. Right. <laughs> and I think that's, in fact, that's a big part of good good carry training is, you know, doing force on force, airsoft work and things like that. And understanding that someone else could think you're the bad guy and understanding when you draw your weapon, you are taking that risk. The cops can show up and think you're the bad guy. That's why, like, if you do discharge, what I've always said is immediately, unless there's still a threat, holster hands up and say, somebody call 911. Because bad guys don't say somebody call 911. Right. You know, bad guys say get on the ground or I'll kill you, or they start shooting people. They don't say call the cops. Yeah, we had a, uh, I was on a church security team for a pretty large church. And one of the rules was if there is a shooting, you don't go running through the hallway with your gun out. Yeah. You don't yeah. draw until you see, until you're really there and you see the threat. Because what is the other person that's well meaning doing? They're scanning for gun. That's what they're looking for. I mean, that's what, I, and I'm not saying they're wrong. That's what I'm looking for. If I heard shots go off in a place, you know, and, I, and again, I don't know what's happened if I haven't directly seen it. For all I know, an undercover detective just shot a perp. I don't know right. what happened. And I think we have to be very, very careful with our mindset on this. Well, and then you also run into a training fault that a lot of people have is they don't know how to move with a firearm. No, so I've their, seen that. So their gun's hard. swinging all over the place as they run, or they trip and fall. And of course, you know where their tri your finger is. It's yeah, on the on trigger. The trigger. They don't have the training, and then pow. You know, yeah, they shoot themselves like that in the worse. You know, it's yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the kind of gun? I, I hate asking this because everybody has their own, you know, special little child gun that they love. That is their thing. I'm a big fan of anything that's very, as far as the gear, the functioning and all 1911 or 1911 like, like this is a, this is a uh, CZ and it's, it's, it's a nine, but it's very much like handling a 1911, but that's personal to me. What are what are your thoughts on things? Well, like that? I have, Two criteria that I say is first, get something that you will carry. You know, a lot of people are, like you said, a 1911. They say, oh, I should get a 1911. And they realize it's like two and a half pounds on their hip. And they're like, I don't carry it anymore because it weighs too much. Yeah. So get something that you will carry. The second thing is get something that you're comfortable using. You know, a lot of people say you need to get a 38 revolver as your first gun because it's, you know, so simple, right? And then yeah. you take, you know, like ladies, you know, they tell ladies all the time, get a 38 revolver. They go to the range and they shoot some defensive loads on there and they don't even get to their first cylinder. And like my hand hurts. They have no yep. confidence. So what yep. do they do? They don't carry it. Or if they do carry it and they need it, they have no confidence in pulling it out and actually using it. But they remember, oh, that really hurt. So yeah. to me, you know, I would rather deal with somebody who has a suboptimal caliber or configuration as long as they have it on them. Because perpetrators really break down into three types. You have the first type that is, as soon as you offer them any level of resistance, you know, pulling out a gun, they're going to stop their attack. Mm -hmm. That's not going to really matter whether it's a 22 or 45. As soon as they see the gun or as soon as they see a knife, they're like, you know what? This isn't worth it. This is not what I signed up for. I right. thought I had an easy victim. I'm out. The second group are the people who will continue, even though you've already pulled that out, and they will continue addressing until they get shot. And yep. even if it's a non-lethal shot, just a shot to the leg, a shot to the arm, or maybe even just heard that crack go by the ear, and they're like, whoop, nope, nope, no, I'm done I'm here. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And really, it doesn't get until you get to the third level of criminal or third category criminal where caliber really plays part. And that's the person who is going to do it till they die, which means you need to have a central nervous system hit, or you need to drop their blood pressure till they don't work anymore, ventilating with holes. In that case, your calibers that people talk about is a minimum of a nine millimeter for 38 caliber. But again, if you're not going to carry a nine or a 38, it's far better to carry a 22. At least, uh, you know, a lot of cases will get, get the job done. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a die hard. You have to have this, you have to have that. You know, if you leave some people like James Yeager, everybody should have a Glock 19. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is no other choice besides that. Yeah. But you know, there, there's, everybody has their favorites. You got the 1911 crew, you got the nine millimeter crew. Look, I have more bullets. Look, I have bigger bullets. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm not so big on caliber it. at all. After there was a study, it was an informal study. I've covered it before. It's it's fairly old now, but it covered something like 600 different times somebody shot somebody, whether it was a cop shooting a perp, whether it was a private citizen shooting a, a, a bad guy, whether it was a bad guy shooting a good guy. And it broke it down by handgun calibers. And it was, what was the percentage of first shot stops? What was the percentage of second shot stops? What were the percentage of lethality? And in that, from 22 to 44 Magnum, you'd think there'd be a big variance. There, it was single-digit percentiles. And what made the difference when it got to a big jump was rifles and shotguns. Right. Rifles and shotguns had this huge number of one-shot stop incapacitation, one-stop anchor kill, and two-shot kill. Right. But handguns were middle of the road, 40 50% across the board. And I'm, that's not my, me advocating carry a 22. I, I'm just pointing out that if that's what it takes to get you to carry, I'd rather you carry that than a sharp stick. Yep. I mean, because numbers are real. And not between a shotgun and a rifle in terms of how much power comes out of those versus a pistol. You yeah. Know, it's the combat guys are going to tell you a pistol is forgetting to your shotgun and rifle. Yep. Yep. But I completely agree. And what I would add to a civilian, pistols. what I add to that as a civilian is if somebody, it's not going to happen here with the perimeter fence, but like when I used to live other places, if somebody knocks on my door at two o'clock in the morning, they may very well just be a person needing help. And it's much easier to conceal a handgun in that situation. So that when you realize you don't need it, like you haven't opened the door with help, how may I help you today? Right? Like um, you're in just a better position with that too. I think that if somebody did mean to come through the door and you have a long gun, it's much easier to push that against your chest. That's this is seems yeah. off with Mark, but real world confrontations are where you learn. So one of the biggest problems that a lot of professional hunters in Africa, especially that go after dangerous game have is no matter who you are, it's almost impossible as a civilian to own a handgun. So these guys end up like going after a wounded leopard or some shit. And when that cat comes out of the grass and plants across their body, they can't right. get a shot off. And I, so I think there's some advantages but yeah, when it comes to terminal capability, it's it's absolutely not even close. Um, what do you think? The person has a handgun now. Is there anything else they should have? Like, obviously, a good way to carry it would be good. <laughs> well, I take a look at it like this. And, you know, handgun is part of what you call an EDC, an everyday carry. Yeah. You know, certain items that you should have on about your body every, you know, every time you leave the house. And a couple of years ago, I got turned on to this catchphrase called the fundamental four by Paul Markle and student of the gun. So they developed this thing. It's kind of like, you know, most of the listeners here are familiar with Dave Canterbury and his five C's. You know, he talks about having a not a, you know, having a cutting tool and combustion. Right. So yeah. they're not specific items. They're just categories. So in the fundamental four, you have something lethal, something okay. sharp, something bright, and something medical. Kind of like a, a minimum gear list of what you should have on your body as a prepared person going out. Now, if you talk to like the really gung-ho, hardcore, you know, gun guys, they're going to be like, you need to have your pistol. You need to have your spare magazine to the pistol. You need to have your backup pistol to your first pistol. You know, they'll, there's you know, a spare magazine for your backup and then a spare magazine for the spare magazine and then one in your butt. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it gets to be like, you know, some people like see that approach and you're like, I don't want to carry that much stuff. Yeah. Well, carry what you're comfortable with. I mean, it, 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 it dictates based on your environment and what your threat level is on what you should carry. Obviously, if you think you're going to get into a gunfight, you probably shouldn't be going there in the first place. Yeah. If you're you know, gearing up oh, like a TV movie, like an 80s movie where they raid the back of the Walmart, you know, before they go do the big thing like Chuck Norris or something. Right. You, you're probably not in the right mindset. So, yeah, I, I look at the fundamental four as a basic. 
you know, I have a firearm because I'm in a state where I'm allowed to carry a firearm and a person's allowed to carry a firearm. I carry a knife as something sharpie. Sometimes things need to be cut. Carry a flashlight because lights go out in big buildings. It can get real dark in a lot of these places. Uh, or if I need to search for something, it's, you know, it gets to be really handy to have some type of light. And medical, it's, I mean, it's real simple to carry, you know, a tourniquet or a compression bandage, just stuff it in your pocket. And, you know, it's, it won't solve every problem, but it solves a lot of problems if you need something like that. I would agree. I would absolutely agree. Um, I would also add to that if you are a licensed carry holder, have your license on you. I know that's pretty obvious, but um, saying you have one is different than demonstrating that you right, have right. one. And I, I have found when I, if I get pulled over by a cop speeding or whatever, and I hand on my driver's license and I can still carry a license. And I said, do you have a weapon in the vehicle? Is there anything you need me to do for you? The response I usually get is an immediate drop down. It's exactly the opposite of what you would expect. Bad guys yeah. don't want to shoot a cop. Don't do that. Right. right. They don't do that. And you know, it's like you, the answer I usually get is some form of don't show me yours and I won't show you mine. Cause I'm right. like, do you, I mean, do you, what do you need you me have to do? So hard you feel comment that you've gone someplace. That means you've passed a state background check to say that you're not a criminal. I mean, you yep. can always become a criminal afterwards. After the fact. At least you've, yeah. you've, you've at least demonstrated some level of either training or criminal history or the lack of a criminal history. Yeah. And the police like to see that. Yeah. And I don't know what it is in every other state because the only place I've ever done it is here. But like here, it's, it's pretty, in, it doesn't feel intensive, but it's pretty intensive. Like you have to go down to either a certified person to do it or you go down to the police station, you get your fingerprints done. That card has to be submitted. It's it's not something you could easily fake and get a hold of. Uh, you, you have, and then, you know, they have immediate access then to the state database, but with your fingerprints as well, then they have to the federal database. So I, I, I think it does kind of just wind a cop down. And as hard as I am on cops at times, I get it, man. Every time you pull somebody over, you have no idea who's in that vehicle. And cops get shot all the time by people that were pulled over because their taillight was out and they had a warrant and they didn't want to go to jail. Like, yep. I, I get it. I get wanting to go home to your to your family. I do, too. That's one of the reasons I carry. Yeah, everybody can have a bad day. So even that person who wouldn't normally do something stupid, you catch them on the right set of circumstances, getting pulled over for doing six over the speed limit might be his that trigger for that person that day. Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, there's a lot of that. That's why I'm like, I always talk about people totally unrelated to carry, but I guess it could involve it. None of the road rage bullshit. When somebody pulls some bullshit on the road, I know you want to give them the finger and tell them to fuck off or whatever, but like, just don't, because you don't know the state of that person's mind. Yep. That person could have got served for a divorce in the morning, pulled over by a cop in the afternoon and fired from his job that evening. And now you're the focus of that rage and it could involve a gun or you know, anybody in a vehicle is armed. I was going to say that, like, if you have a 6,000 pound vehicle that can move at 100 miles an hour, you have a weapon. So just don't. Just yep. don't. I, I don't know about you. I found when I started carrying my willingness to be aggressive did not go up, it went down. Yeah, I was just the about weight to of the responsibility. Most people who go to get carry permits, they understand that there's a, a, a higher level of of weight on your shoulders and responsibility. You're like, I can't be stupid. I can't do the stupid things. I was just talking like a month ago to a guy who's getting hit or who just got his concealed carry permit in New York state. He goes, man, I used to be a hothead. And now I'm yeah. like, nope, nope, nope. Walk can't away. You know, let somebody, can't I mean, it. it's New York. So, you know, the, the, the lifestyle and the, and the speak of a New York person in New York oh, yeah. is a lot, you know, like, yeah, screw you, you know, yeah, yeah, it feels like Philly's the same way, man. Like it, it, people get in fights over absolute nothing. Like you come down to Texas, nobody acts like that. I, I, I don't know what the cultural thing is, but like two guys bump into each other. Hey, man, you got a problem? Like, no, yeah, well, yeah you do, right? Like you're like, what is wrong with you? You know, and and, and it it isn't a gun thing that people because like I said, the '90s you couldn't even carry here. So and it was already that way. It was very weird. When people first came here, just the cultural difference, like people that visited me from Pennsylvania, New York State, et cetera, we, we'd go to the grocery store to pick some stuff up on the way home or something. And like you just have this conversation with somebody in line, 
you know, and then they, you leave the store and they're like, well, how do you know them? And you're like, I don't know that. I don't even know their name. I just, and they can't believe you just had this open conversation with a total stranger while you waited for groceries. Right. But yeah. So like, I do think it does wind that hothead down because not only do you have a higher responsibility because you're armed, the law sees it. You took the course, you got the permit. Now you have a better understanding of proper use of force. So right. it's it, it can actually be used as a prosecution mechanism if you're wrong in the way that you behave. Yeah, I agree. Um, on that. The uh, you know you know a little bit about making holsters. What do you feel makes a good holster? Uh, holsters really come in like three features that you really should have. One is protect the trigger from being activated, so you don't want an accidental discharge. So your holster really should cover that trigger guard prevent accidental discharge. The second feature that you're really looking for in a holster is when you put it on or wherever you put it, it should stay where it is. Um, you know, typically, you know, it's cliche ish, but you'll see a woman, she'll get a firearm and she'll just throw a pistol into her bag. And then when she needs it, she has to dig around the bag, but it's not exactly where she put it. So yeah. your second, your, your second, you know, thing you're looking for in holsters, Put it wherever I put that pistol, I want it to be there when I go to grab it. If it's on my hip, I want it to be exactly at that same position. Um, the third thing is really just to protect the firearm. And, you know, cosmetic scratches, you know, people don't like to see them, but it is to protect, you know, the, the finish of the firearm. Protect your sights from getting banged around, at, you know, so that when you go to draw it, it's still, you know, pointed in the right direction. So those are kind of the things that make a good holster. And that can be done with all sorts of things. I mean, I work primarily in Kydex, which is a thermal form plastic. You heat it up, you squish it around it, cut away what you don't need. But you can get holsters that meet those requirements that are both nylon or leather. I mean, there's a lot of different materials that you can use to, but you're looking for something, protect the trigger guard so it doesn't accidentally go off. Keep it where you put it last, you know, whether it's on your belt or in your pack, you know, clipped onto your pack. And then the last one is just kind of protect it overall. I will say I get a little because it, no matter what I do, it's never completely comfortable, right? Like um, women with their purses, if they have a proper concealed carry handbag that has like a specific place for that weapon to be, you know, they can take that thing wherever they go, anytime that they go there and they're always comfortable. The downside is it's a thing that is separate from your body and that's yep. the negative, you know hanging on the back of a chair or something, or, you know, like you, you, then you still have to worry about being able to get access to that. But one of the things that I've had a lot of over the years of doing the show is people that have companies and whatnot. And there was a gentleman many, many years ago who sent me a holster and he was looking to try to do something together. And he asked me what I carried and I told him and he sent me a holster for that. And he was very proud of it. And I put it on my belt and I, and it did feel pretty good. And then I tried to draw it and I'm all for retention holsters if that's what you want, but I don't want it retained from me. And this was not a retention holster. I couldn't draw the weapon. It yep. was so poorly designed that when I tried to draw the weapon, it stuck. And I don't mean a little bit. I mean, like you're pulling your, you're giving yourself a wedgie. Right. And, and I told him, I said, I can't work with you. And he said, well, if you adjust this and that, I'm like, man, I don't <laughs> You know, like the way that you can draw, and I've only ever had one do that, but it like stuck in my head that that is something people need to be aware of. You need to multiple draw that weapon and make sure you got a good, clean draw. And I'm not talking about trying to be Bob London and shooting balloons at 300 yards with a snubby, right? I'm just saying like that, it has to function well. Right. You have, when you're dealing with like thermal form, you know, Kydex type holsters, and there's a thousand people probably in the United States that make that have holster companies that you know do the same thing that I do. Uh, but it only takes a few hundredths of an inch molding difference between the mold and the real gun to really throw off the way the gun feels. Uh, you know, you like me probably been around and, and had the leather holsters way back in the day. Yeah. Leather holster, your draw angle that you come out of that holster is much wider than Kydex. Correct. The Kydex doesn't give, it doesn't flex in the same direction, the same ways that leather does. So your draw from like a Kydex holster needs to be a lot straighter, a lot more in line with the holster. 
And you have, you know, you talk about, you know, you know, fighting to, to jerk that thing out of, out yeah. of the holster. It happens all the time. Sometimes it is the, you know, the, the way it's molded in. Sometimes it's the, mm-hmm. the direction that you carry it on your belt. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, this is a problem that a lot of women have is you know, like, oh, I'm going to carry a, a holster on a belt. And then they wear one of these little spaghetti thin belts and, you know, an inch and a half belt loop on a belt that's like a half inch wide has a lot of slack on it. And all of a sudden yeah. it's not coming straight up and down out of the holster. So you run into those problems. But you are absolutely right in terms of when you get a new piece of gear, you need to clear your gun, make yeah. sure it's empty put it in and out, work it and make sure that that is actually drawing the way you want, you know, gotcha. uh, you know, maybe yeah. there are some adjustments that you can do to adjust that. Sometimes there are, sometimes there are not. maybe it's, I need to move it a little bit further on my belt, you know, uh, you know, inside the waistband, IWB carry is very popular for a lot of people. It's how I carry my pistols. But when I strap the belt on and I pull my belt tight, it puts additional pressure on the holster. So you need to make sure that, where you put it on your body as you put your belt on and you snug it up for the day, can I still comfortably draw it out and make sure that it works for me? And you know, you bring a good point up there too with if you are wearing clothing that is significantly different from what you normally wear and you put your weapon on before you leave, you mo- you want to check that, right? You know, if you wear the same clothes every day, you wear blue jeans and a t-shirt like me, then there's a certain you know way that that, that equipment will carry. And if all of a sudden you're in dress slacks, like you said, instead of this big, huge, thick leather belt I wear, now you're down to some little dress belt or something. It, it can have that effect, a uh, differential. It yeah. certainly makes a difference. Yeah. Um, are there any special considerations for women? We kind of talked about the purse thing, but um, more and more women are carrying, which I think is great. I've had a lot of women over the years say something like, I don't have to worry. He's got me. And they're talking about their husband. I'm like, well, who's got right. him? Who's got him, right? Like you know, you, you you're in a in a Denny's and uh, twenty people are, are getting shot, and there's more than one shooter. Like you know, and, and does he have you when you're leaving work and going out to your car in the back of the parking lot at seven thirty in the winter when it's dark by then? Like right. So I'm glad they're doing it, but are do, in your experience as an equipment manufacturer, have there any specific things that women should think about or that well, we should think about for the women shock some life. people and tell you women are different than men i, I know some people <laughs> refuse to accept that uh you, the breakdown is really in two areas one is the physical bill they're usually a smaller yeah. stature person and their curves are different than our curves so where your hips are and where your belt is on your hip compared to where a woman is kind of will change the angle so you'll find sometimes a woman with a belt holster you carry it at three o'clock and all of a sudden it's jamming them in their ribs because that's the way that their hips are angled with their belt. So you kind of run into the, the physical characteristics. The other one is women don't like dressing like men. They don't like wearing blue jeans. And if they wear blue jeans, they want to wear them skin tight. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you can't really, you know, as soon as you put a pistol in there, it's printing all over. Printing is when you can see the shape of a firearm underneath your clothing. So they like to wear tighter clothing or lighter, um, lighter fabrics, you know, the lighter this fabric that, that you're wearing, the more it conforms around the pistol. So it more, it shows that you have a pistol. So guys generally wear heavier weight t-shirts, baggier jeans. So it's a lot easier to, to conceal that women don't have, but women have a lot of options. Like you mentioned before, the conceal carry permits, uh, conceal carry purses, uh, there's also backpacks, sling bags, fanny packs. They're all designed to carry a concealed firearm that women kind of gravitate towards because it's just easy. I don't have to worry about my clothing choice changes. Yeah, I just grab this bag or I grab the sling pack and I know I, I pull a zipper and there's my firearm when I need it. Uh, one of the things that's really been popular that I've seen with women who want to carry on their body is a thing called, I brought one here today. It's called Ulta Clip is the company. And what they do is they have a cam clip. Okay. I don't know if you can see that very well. Yeah. Yeah. So that would, what this allows you to do, it's an inside the carry type holster, but this clips onto the top of your belt hem or your pants hem. So you could wear yeah. yoga pants 
clip this on this has about 90 pounds of retention force on there so it's going to stay in place even when you go to draw it so you know there there are options for women that are you know if you want to wear a skirt without a belt you can still carry an inside the waistband in that type of you know there's different types of uh you know options available to people like that uh but again you know you're talking about the size difference Women can't carry a full size 1911 typically that a, a guy can, you know, a double stack pistol, which really runs them into a problem that a lot of women have is they want a smaller gun. Mm -hmm. So they get something like a Glock 43X or a Springfield Hellcat. I mean, everybody's kind of making these, you know, short barrel pistols that yeah. have like a full size grip because they want to be able to be comfortable in grabbing that firearms. But well, what happens is, is now you have a lot of weight above the belt line, mm -hmm. and these guns tend to flop. Yes, yes. You want to have that counterbalance of a, a muzzle either pushing against your body or just the weight of it, you know, yeah. a rocking on the So they'll get a gun, they'll get a gun like that, and they'll put, you know, 13 rounds in a magazine, and be like, oh, it feels great, it's nice and slim, and then they go to put it on, and it just flops away from the body, which is partly they're not wearing a strong enough belt. You know, the, the stiffer your belt, the less flop there is. Yes. So you get you you can counteract some of this stuff, and then they're like, "I don't want to wear a belt like a dude would wear," and I don't blame you. I mean, you want to be a woman, you want to look like a woman. So you know, their pistol choices that they have tend to be smaller ones. But then you get, like I said, they're more likely to carry a smaller one. But then they go to shoot them, they're like, "I don't really like shooting this thing." Dead on. Well, it's, like it's I would events. tell any guy, you got a woman in your life, girlfriend, wife, whatever, and you're thinking about getting her to the point where she's comfortable carrying. Do, sh as far as what you think she should carry, just shut up. Your opinion is meaningless. I don't care how experienced you are. Take her to a gun range. Most gun ranges will rent various handguns. Pick out various different forms, calibers and forms, revolver, auto, compact subcompact whatever rent the guns let her shoot them then she can tell you what she wants i don't care what you want i want the person comfortable with the weapon my wife just like you said first time she fired a snub nose 38 the one even plus peaks like nope not doing it don't like it and could fire a compact nine no problem because of the mm -hmm. action of the slide right yep. you know and and i don't get it because i shoot a snub 38 and it's I don't like it barely moves my hand. I don't understand, you know, even if I'm not being intentional with recoil control, I don't get how, but it doesn't matter that it doesn't right. bother you. Right. Don't ever tell somebody else because something's comfortable for you. It's comfortable for them, no matter what it is, because you don't know you're not them. Right. It goes back to my thing. If it works for you, then it works. Yes. You know, my yeah. opinion of what should or shouldn't work. If it's actually working for you, then I need to shut up and just let you do with what works for you. Uh, you want to tell folks a little bit about your company? And uh, I will yeah, sure. bring your website up while you do it. Okay. Company is called Ares Tactical. It's after the Greek god of war, not the zodiac symbol, which has an I in it. We're yeah. a custom, uh, custom Kydex maker. Uh, I cover the whole gamut of stuff from concealed carry to thigh holsters, uh, shoulder holsters, uh, my real niche in my market is, is that I have a very large selection of weapon lights that's uh, becoming more and more popular as the years go on. People are attaching lights and lasers to your guns. And because I make mine one at a time, I can have, you know, swap things in and out relatively simple versus, you know, going to somebody like Safari Land who makes a great holster. But if they're not selling 10 or 50,000 of a holster, they're not going to make that combination for you. So... What we do is one at a time, your order comes in, we put the parts and pieces together, we mold it up, and then we ship it on out to you. You know, right now we're running about three to four week lead time on our holsters. So I've never really gone out and done any type of advertising stuff like that because my pipe, my pipeline is usually pretty full. I mean, you, know, as, you know, as you're poking around the pages, I mean, I do everything from, you know, like I said, the regular inside the waistband, outside the waistband. If you need to get a hold of me at the bottom of that page is my text number, or my email address. Say, hey, Matt, I got this weird combination or this is what I'm looking at doing. I've 
had all sorts of weird projects people have come to me for and said hey i need to do something like this and i'll be like mm, let me think on that and get back to you you know work project but you know said so i i have been very very blessed in terms of you know starting with just a simple inside the waistband holster and then i was like well what's the next problem to solve what's the next problem to solve you know one of the things that we do is uh, or we're pretty popular with is our our molly holsters you know a lot of the tech you know it's not a concealed carry thing but a lot of tactical guys want to run it on their battle belts or on their plate carriers mm -hmm. or law enforcement officers and there's not a lot of guys out there that you know work down that platform so i've been pretty busy with doing stuff like that yeah yeah i, I will say that to me the most comfortable way to carry a handgun is a shoulder holster it just doesn't work well especially in my climate for concealed but i, I it, it, if i had my choice that's what i would do all the time yeah. I, I really would it's just so comfortable and the cross draw you know yeah. weak side cross draw hand strong side like just well, I've never been my degrees outside. Nobody wants to wear a jacket. No, no. But you yeah. know, like during the winter, I'll wear a jean jacket a lot, and then it's just, it's just fine. I mean, it's yeah. just perfect, you know. But there's uh, a, there's a lot of people who have to wear the business suit. Yeah, and for them, it works great. I mean, I, I get would, a lot of law enforcement, you know, detectives. Yeah, order your shoulder holsters up. I uh, see a lot of truckers who sit yeah. in their truck all day long, and it's, you know. Shoulder holsters have their pluses and minuses. They, you know, they have people tell you that's the worst thing that you could possibly ever do, but it's got some significant advantages too. Like if you're sitting in a vehicle or even if you're just, you know, at a, uh, a shop or something like that, and you start to notice something and you're like, that doesn't look right. You know, yeah. is it far more suspicious to put your hand on your hip? Yes. Or, to, you know, just kind of slide yes. your hand in on top yes. of that hand right there and just kind of wait things out and Agreed. see what's going to happen agreed a hundred percent and you know your your weapon is no use to you if because it was uncomfortable you removed it like and yep. I, I would agree with you if you are have a job where you can carry and you have to wear some sort of a blazer or suit coat I, that's i mean i wouldn't do anything else i mean th th that's what i would do every day that i was in that garb um, and it's just from years of doing it and just saying that that is just a more comfortable thing yeah personally. And I wouldn't argue with somebody that said, not for me, you know, bro. Yeah. Like what work, like you said it earlier, what works for you is what works. Well, let um, me say this to the people who are just thinking about concealed carry and they haven't done it before. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned comfort, you know, there's a, a saying that's out there carrying a gun should be comforting, not comfortable. Okay. To a degree, but really anything that you start to change about the way you carry or you start to carry, it's going to be different. It's going to feel different. It's not going to feel right. And it'll take you maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks before Agreed. you start to settle into, hey, now it feels comfortable. Now, if I you know, run out the door and I'm like, wait a second, something doesn't feel right. You're like, oh, I'm missing this piece of gear. Eventually, it becomes part of your you know, part of who you are as you move about. And it becomes less of a problem or less of a distraction to you. So like I said, if you're just starting to get into it, try something out. If the first thing doesn't work, go to the next thing. You know, you, you, there is going to be a solution for everybody. You, sometimes you just have to try it inside the waistband. Okay, it doesn't fit here. Let me slide it over to this part of my body. Okay, maybe it's the gun and, you know, not the holster, you know, or, or the type of carry system that you're at. You know, so you got to, you know, you got to play with it a little bit. Like I said, it's what works for you. Don't listen to the other guy who says this is the only way to go because they're not you. They don't have your body type. They don't have your experience. They don't live the same life. I mean, the guy who's, you know, works in the gun shop, stands behind the counter all day, lives a different lifestyle than you who might be a secretary at an office who sits in a chair all day at the front, you know, answering the phone. So what feels comfortable to him because he's standing maybe an appendix carry is not going to feel the same for somebody sitting down at a desk, you know, jabbing them up. So real quick here, uh, let's take a few questions and comments and I only got three folks. So if you posted one and don't see it, you can repost a question in all caps. We'll make it more likely uh, that we won't miss you there. So um, anyway, with that said, let's go ahead and start out with Rachel's question. 
Years ago, a gun safety class being given by the chief of Reading Police talked about getting a Utah Arizona, or Arizona carrying permits to cover more states. Is that a thing? And I think that's because of the states that Pennsylvania, at least at the time, Rachel's talking about, and their reciprocity agreements. Yeah, every state has their own other states that they're willing to recognize. So Missouri is recognized in Arkansas, but not necessarily recognized in, I don't know, for, you know, I'll just throw one out, like California. So Missouri usually, usually states, and it's changed over the years since Bruin, but yeah, the surrounding states, they'd have a reciprocity agreement. Okay, you're one or two states over, we'll honor yours if you honor ours. Yeah. What happened is, is that some of these states were honored in more areas than others. So like she said, mentioned Utah and Arizona, they might have a different set of states that they cover in terms of reciprocity. And they allow you to, as a non-resident, get a concealed carry permit. Like Florida was a big one, you know, when I was, you know, in the early 2000s, where the Florida concealed carry permit, you could get that as a non-resident. Yep. And it carried in a ton of other states. That yeah, I used to have one for that reason. Yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely true. Uh, again, you take a look at what areas you're going to and you can decide if you have, you know, if your state has reciprocity with it. If not, you can look into the other states that have reciprocity and see if they have a concealed carry permit for non-residents. Residents, yeah. I think it's becoming less of an issue, but like I think the people that really need to think about that is like if you always go someplace and they don't recognize you, but they do recognize somebody else, that could be a big indicator that you might want to do that. Um, Mr. Fixie, uh, not really a question, but I, I think I agree with this, you know, carry your lawyer's uh, 24-7 phone number. I, I do think it's a good idea for everyone to have a lawyer. Like, it doesn't mean that you're paying them a retainer or anything, but somebody that you know and they know you. And in any situation, you're not relying on the police to provide you an attorney. Um, and that goes back to when you talked about training. And I said, get into a concealed carry firearms class. In yeah. most cases, those classes will have a section of the class that's a classroom based that will tell you or what you should look for after an incident. See, that's where people get in trouble. You know, before the incident, during the incident, they're not usually getting in trouble. And then after the incident, they run their mouth. They say the wrong thing. They think they're trying to be helpful and, and throwing too much stuff out there. You know, some people are going to say, hey, don't say anything. You know, if you're in a shooting, yeah. you don't say anything. And you have people like Masada Yub, who's a firearms trainer and court expert, said, you know, that's not necessarily what you want to do because you know what they're going to do? They're going to see you have a gun and a dead person. You're going to get cuffed. And then you're going to wait for a lawyer to come and explain, you yeah. know, explain your yeah. side. Yeah. In terms of getting a lawyer, uh, it's always good to have a lawyer. You know, there's companies yeah. out there that say they have concealed carry insurance. Uh, they generally, you know, sometimes work, sometimes work, but definitely having a lawyer, like uh, the one that I've most heard other people suggest is called lawyers on retainer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have a phone number and it doesn't matter what it is, criminal or not, they are duty bound to help you out. You know, USCCA in the last couple of years have had a couple of major cases where they told their people who paid for insurance, we're not going to defend you because we think you're a criminal. He's, you know, yeah. broken down in term. Yeah, you know, that's the simplified version. But yeah, they I have, have no, go ahead. Oh, the insurance companies have no obligation or duty to represent you for a criminal action. And if you're being Correct. charged with homicide because you use it in self-defense, they have that easy out to be like, that, oh, that's no, a we, we're not defending you from a criminal action. I, Which I got is why it. would that gentleman recommend that, you know, have a lawyer that you know, a lawyer will represent you no matter what happens. An insurance company represents you sometimes. Insurance companies represent you when they believe that it is in their best interest to represent you, that it will be more likely than not that they will not have to make a payment by representing you than not representing you. And that's a business decision. Uh, I had Mossad on years ago. I've run his show as a rewind several times because it's so important. It was on Lethal Force Aftermath. And his view was when the cops get there, the bad guy is laying on the ground bleeding to death or already dead, doing a really good job of pretending to be a victim, right? On the other hand, when you're like, I don't talk to cops, that's not good for you. And his basic advice, and I, I encourage everybody to at least listen to that episode and consider taking his course, honestly, 
um, is you give an account of what happened one time. You, you sit down and you say, this is what happened and this is why it happened. And then you be quiet. Then you say, and I will be happy to speak to you further after I confer with counsel. And if anything is said other than yes, sir, you say, I'm sorry, are you denying me counsel? Right. And that way you haven't, you have been forthcoming. You have explained what occurred, but you've also not given away additional information. If they start wanting to talk about what you had for lunch or some shit, that's not, this is what just happened. And I'm telling you what happened. And now I, and so you've kind of balanced the whole, uh, yes. it doesn't benefit me to talk to you, but in the situation we're in, I do owe you some level of explanation. And as much as that dude's done and as many juries as he's talked to and as many court cases as he's been in, I tend to trust his advice. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's, yeah, that's you're absolutely like right. With that, you know, uh, you know, a, a thing that happens when people brandish a firearm in a self-defense situation is bad guys often like to call the cops and say, you pointed a gun at me. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. if you are in a situation where you pull out a firearm, you should be on the police right away saying, Hey, this guy just came at me with a screwdriver or, you know, he was banging on my windshield, you know, yeah. trying to break into my car. You need to get your account out there first. So yeah. when a police officer rolls up, if it happens that they decide yeah. to roll up, yeah. they at least have a frame of reference that maybe yeah. you are the innocent victim. Yeah. Yeah. This guy just tried to jack me and I, I, I sent him off with a gun pointed at him because, yeah, that you'd think that wouldn't happen because that guy didn't want to get caught. But he knows you have a gun and whatever he pointed at you or threatened you with, he can have gotten rid of, rid of by the time they ever actually speak to him. Or he may call that in, uh, what do you call anonymously? Yeah. I was minding my own business and this guy in this car pointed a gun at me. Did you get his license num plate number? Yes, sir, I did. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean they're going to try to be not the victim. Yeah. Or they're going to try to be the victim. So, yeah. if the, yeah. you know, like said, in a carjacking situation, somebody comes up, points a pistol at your window or starts smashing at your window trying to get in. Yeah, they're gonna run away and be like, "I couldn't get the car, but I'm gonna mess with this guy today. I'm gonna call it in." And say, "I was just walking down the street. This guy pointed a gun at me." Yeah, yeah, I, I highly <laughs> recommend dash cameras yeah. for a lot of reasons too. I'll just say that um, these last two I'm gonna put together because they're kind of the same thing stated differently. Survivalizer says, "Do you have a less than lethal OC stun gun options?" I missed it. Uh, you're more a holster guy anyway, but you can give us your thoughts on those. Um, and, and Rachel says, what's your opinion on pepper ball launchers like Brenya? Um, I'll start off with, I think that everybody, at least in your vehicle, should have a really big full-size can of pepper spray. And it has a lot less to do with what we're talking about today and a lot more to do with people getting drug out of their vehicles and these situations with these protesters on the roads and shit, and people trying to drag protesters off the road. If I'm trying to go somewhere on the highway and I'm trying to get somebody to the hospital and there's one of these environmental protesters or something, they're just getting painted. And I guarantee you they're going to move. They're not going to stay there for very long. And there's other situations that I think that is a, a beneficial thing. And, and I'll let you say your thought on this. But the the, the Brenna or I don't remember how you pronounce it. Yeah, I heard about this on some talk radio station. Yep. I looked it up and I looked and there were guys that literally bought it. And sh I don't advise this. They shot each other with it. They said, yeah, it really hurts. It's really disoriented. But they also were still completely functional. And so... What I've never seen is somebody completely functional with their face completely painted with pepper spray. The Brenna thing, I'm not sure about. Well, I, I'm not sure what, what their formula is in there and whether it is based on which state you actually reside in. In some states, you can have certain uh, yeah. chemicals in there that you can in other states. You know, having a less lethal or a non-lethal option is always nice to have, but you don't necessarily, I mean, like I said, I'm carrying a pistol, I'm carrying a flashlight, I'm carrying yeah. a cell phone, I'm carrying yeah. a wallet. And all of a sudden you, I want to add in, you know, a burn a pistol or something like, or you yeah. know, OC spray. Yeah. At some point you're like, I have enough. And again, this goes back to your martial arts training. Yeah. Are you, you know, confident enough that you can handle yourself? Maybe that's something that you can leave off because I feel like I can, you know, de either verbally dis de escalate the situation or I can handle myself at least enough that I'm not having to draw a firearm. It's, yeah. I'm never going to tell somebody don't have an additional option, but if somebody has a knife 
and they're 10 feet away and you decide to pull out pepper spray, it's not going to go well for you. No, no, no. But it, it does have a – I've seen people hit with it. It instantly fucks them up. But I've also seen people hit with it. it I've never seen it not work. What I have seen is a f- fairly significant delay till it becomes incapacitating before the, the 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 will of the person to keep their eyes open and the body's need to close them, com- you know, collide. And I've seen that take ten seconds. I've seen it take half a minute. And then yeah. if somebody's trained to fight through it, like a lot of law enforcement and military, we train to fight through it. They can tend to last a lot longer with it. But it is another option. And uh, I will also say the people that say shit like it. Well, I knew this guy from Special Forces. Are you in Special Forces? No, shut up. But, you know, it usually ends with, he used to put it on his MREs. I'm like, I eat jalapenos on everything. But but an hour and a half after I cut the jalapenos, if I forgot I did it and I touched my eye, that's that's totally different experience right there. So I think it works. But the Brenda stuff, I, I don't really, I think that's for a person that doesn't want a gun. That's what I think it's for. I don't think it's valid if you don't if you don't feel like you can take somebody's life. Yeah, don't carry a gun. Maybe a burn is a better solution for you. Uh, I mean, there's applications where the dogs, you know, in your front yard barking at your dog, and you're like, oh, you know, time for you to leave, dog. You know, you're biting my dog or something. You know, yeah, want to kill the neighbor's dog. Yeah, yeah, light them up with a little bit of pepper spray and separate them. And it can help, but let me tell you something. Dogs have a a, a resistance to this that humans don't. So, and I would have never believed this. Our little Malinois Belle, the one day, she eats everything. And she was in total puppy mode still. And she got a hold of something, and I was about to go in the bedroom to see what it was. And then I heard, (laughs) and I'm like, what the hell? She had gotten a... Uh, 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 like a three and a half ounce canister of cold steel uh, pepper spray. Mm -hmm. And she bit through the metal and she took it full in the mouth. She wasn't happy, but I would have been a puddle of goo on the ground because I've been hit with that shit. Just a little bit of it. Like she was like rubbing her face and all, but if she wanted to eat you, it would not have prevented you being eaten. I'm telling you right now, I'm amazed at how dogs respond to that. I've also seen it kind of make them go away. Like I had a dog in my face walking down a road one time and I was armed and I did have some pepper spray and I just squirted a little squirt on the ground in front of it. And it was like, you know, I don't want to do this. And it went away. And that's, I'd rather tell my neighbor, I shot a little pepper spray at your dog. than right. uh, then here's your dog. Right. But yeah, it, I'm, I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe that. Like, I, I three and a half ounce canister, that's a lot. It's stained yeah. the floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and it's right there. There is no you know, separation distance. Oh, right in the mouth, right? She got it right in the freaking mouth. And, man, I, I took her outside and hosed her face off and all, but I, five minutes, she didn't even care. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. Maybe she's a freak. I, I don't know, but... Don't think that it's necessarily going to make canines go away. Hey, man, this has been a great discussion. Remember, folks, uh, his, Matt's uh, site is AriesTactical.net, and that's A-R-E-S, Aries Tactical, not the astrological sign, but the God of War. And I'll have links to that and his Instagram and whatever else is in here uh, in the show notes on the audio side, which will be live about 30 minutes after we finish. There's a link in the video notes below. And if you click it right now while we're live, you won't go anywhere because we're not done yet. Anyway, Matthew, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Jack. Well, guys, I appreciate Matthew being with us today. This was a great discussion. And I hope that if you have been thinking about concealed carry, that maybe this gives you the little push and the impetus to get whatever training you need and to get the equipment you need and to do whatever you need to do in your state to be able to carry and to start doing so. The more people that carry the less problems we shall have. I'm telling you, um, especially with the gun grabbing and things like that, like the number one thing you can do if you want to protect the Second Amendment is convert more people into responsible gun owners. When people own guns and then they hear people talking about seizing guns, it's personal. It's not some arbitrary third-party thing anymore. It becomes real to them. So I, I suggest 
be a responsible gun owner and create more responsible gun owners and look after your neighbors and your friends and your strangers around you because you would hope if you were under duress, somebody would look after you. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, wrap things up. I want to uh, remind you guys that you can help support this show and the work that we do by doing your online shopping starting at tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Today's item of the day is nothing to do with concealed carry, but it is a great lifestyle item. And it's the same one as yesterday, and they're still on sale for now anyway. The Insta AccuSlim Sous Vide Precision Cooker. I love this thing. It is just awesome. 75 bucks is a stupid cheap price for it. There's a ton of things that you can do with sous vide that makes your life just a little bit better. I've had this particular model now for over a year. No problems, and I don't really take care of it the way I should. Uh, it pretty much lives outside in my outdoor kitchen unprotected, and it's lasted a year that way. So it will probably last you many years if you keep it in the kitchen where it actually belongs. Uh, and I want to point out, this is on sale. It's a good discount. It's about $25 worth of discount, about 25% off. It will go away. It will not stay on sale because I price watch stuff. And I wanted to throw out a little hopeful impetus for you guys to join the Telegram channel if you haven't done so yet. If nothing else, just for things like this. So last week, I, I ran the Soundcore Spirit X2 wireless earbuds, which I love because of the ones that kind of hook on your ear and don't fall into the garden hole when you're digging a hole or into your pond when you're fishing or something like I don't know why Bluetooth earpieces just fall out of my head and end up in bad places. So these are on sale. They were about 50 percent off the retail and they were marketed as being renewed. And I immediately when I ordered them, myself said they were not renewed, that Soundcore was basically doing an inventory dump like we have discontinued this item. We have a new item. We want to get rid of it, but we want to kind of do it to people that wouldn't buy the product that's replacing it anyway. So we don't cannibalize ourselves. Well, if you're watching the video right now, currently unavailable, we do not know when or if this item will be back in stock. I know it won't be. It's gone. It's a discontinued item from uh, Anchor Soundcore. And I have a pretty good nose for sniffing this stuff out. Everything in my product catalog at TSPAS, I maintain price watches on. And when something like this comes up, I let you guys know about it. In this case, it wouldn't have mattered. You had a good week before they sold out. There are times when I get deals like this and I put them out and I drop them on social media. And by the time I do the show episode and people watch it live and they know about it, and then the email goes out or you get an alert in your podcast app or whatever, and you listen to it the next day. And you're like, oh, shit, that's a good deal. It's gone. There's times I put out these things on TSPAS at 8 o'clock in the morning. And by the time I go live at noon for the show, it's gone. So if for nothing other than that, consider getting on the Telegram channel. If you get on the channel, not the group, you don't have to listen to a whole bunch of chatter from everybody else in the community if you don't want to do that. You'll get about three or four alerts a day from me, and that'll be it. So definitely consider doing that. Anyway, guys, it's time to wrap up. Survivalizer says now he's hungry. Yeah, dude, I'm kind of hungry, too. It is 1.42 in the afternoon here, and I haven't eaten yet, so I'm going to sign off. Tomorrow we will have an expert council Q&A show for the week, and then we will do a Friday flashback, and then next week, once again, we will do it all over again. Thank you for tuning in today. And, again, you can just support the show Anytime you shop online by starting at tspaz.com or becoming